Okay. So I'm sharing my screen. I'm going to go into presenter view. I'm going to bring this down here. And so you're all seeing the screen now? Yeah. Okay. So let me go to full screen mode and let me move this down here. Okay. So um, let me. Okay, so here is your 60 second task. What I want you to do is recall a time in your profession or social life where you did something with the intention of building and nurturing a professional or personal relationship. So we're interested in a situation where you try to create or maintain a connection that would aid the execution of some work task and your professional success or for emotional support and friendship. Other people who engage in this type of introspective task frequently write about instances where they're accept invitations for receptions and drinks because they want to meet potential clients or friends. So I want you to take um, a few seconds more and think of a time when you did one of these things. Okay. And while I do that, I'm gonna juggle the screen just for an instant so that I can also see your wonderful Faces. Back again to present. Okay. So, did you all get a chance to do that? Okay. Now, uh, are, you, are you seeing my screen or not yet? Okay, so let me go ahead and share my screen again and go back into full mode. Yes, Chris, sure, whatever, whatever it takes, absolutely. <laughs> I'm, responding, I'm responding to your chat message, absolutely. I was halfway uh, being facetious, halfway serious. Why not, why not, okay. Now, the next one I want you to do is again, do one more 60 second. I'm gonna have three of these tasks. The second 60 second task is this one. So this time what I wanted to do is to, rec oops, uh, here we go. Recall a time in your profession where you found yourself interacting with people at a social event, such as a party. And we're interested in a situation where connections that would aid the execution of work tasks and your professional success develop for you professionally uh, or for emotional support develop for you for personally. And so other people engaging in this kind of a task would frequently write about instances where they attended one of their coworkers or friend's birthday party or an office or a Christmas party. Okay, so can you think of an instance when you engaged in something that looked like this? Now I can see your faces, I can see your videos for those of you who have it on. And so I'm going to, uh, change my camera so that you'll see me not looking down at you. There we go. Okay. And now are we ready for the last 60 second task? And this one, I want you to complete the following words. Everyone done? Do you need some more time? A little more time, 10 seconds more? Looks like everyone is pretty much done, right? Does anyone need more time? Raise your hand. All good? Are we ready? Okay, so why don't we see what kinds of things you said? So I'm going to make it a little more interactive and say, what did you put for the first one? Just, just uh, unmute yourself and speak up. With? 
You put wish? Who was that? Uh, with. Oh, wit. Very good. Okay. What are those? Others who want to jump in? What did y'all put? Wish and wish. Wish. Okay. Wish. Okay. Any others? No? Silence? What about the next one? Book. 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 What about the next one? Soup. 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 Okay. The next one. Shaper. 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 What else? Any Shower. others? Shower. Shower. Okay. Okay. Next one. Foot. Flop. Okay. <laughs> Okay, Hello. and the last one. Hey, here. Hey, here. Okay, so here's what happens here. This was actually a study that was conducted by some colleagues of ours, some of them here at Northwestern, others in Toronto, et cetera. And it actually reveals something very interesting about people's networks, believe it or not. It turns out that because of the so-called ick factor that we talked about, some of you might have felt more dirty when you were answering and thinking back about instances when you engaged in something sleazy like trying to do network for instrumental goals for instrumental purposes etc others of you didn't feel that icky some felt more icky than others and guess what the extent to which you felt icky shows up in how you responded to this fill in the word fill in the letters on this word. Those of you who felt more icky would have chosen the word wash rather than wish. Those of you who felt more icky would have used the word soap rather than step. And those of you who felt more icky would have used the word shower rather than shaker. Uh, that makes sense. <laughs> and this is actually a very profound uh, way of trying to understand that people do have this ick factor. Some people have it more than others. And one has to think through why that is. You, you understand why I'm, I'm using the words wash, soap, and showers, because you literally feel dirty. And it is a sense of morality. It is a sense in which we as individuals make sense of who we are in large part based, and not only who we are, but how others are, based on what psychologists refer to as a sense of morality. That is whether we are doing the right thing or not. It turns out we vary quite a lot in what constitutes moral behavior. And the irony of this is that people who are actually more powerful don't see that, don't feel the ick factor of networks. Why do you think that is? They are used, there are a couple of reasons. One is they feel that it's perfectly appropriate to be able to reach out to other people in order to be able to accomplish more because they feel a sense of innate power and they don't feel any guilt in that. The second reason is they also feel that they have the ability to help other people and reciprocate it. So from that sense of power and that sense of the ability or the knowledge that you can reciprocate these things, you're less likely to feel guilty or immoral or dirty or icky. The tragedy is while this helps those who are in powerful positions, the same research that these individuals did showed that it literally hurts those who need networking the most. So the irony of course is that the people who need to gain most are people who are not in positions of power. And they are the ones who are the most likely to feel icky, to feel dirty, to feel immoral about it. So that's, that's the bad news. And that bad news continues even further because it affects the ways in which we think about our network. So this basically says, we don't, even if we have a network, we don't feel good about using it. We feel bad about using it. We feel icky about the word networking because it seems like something's sleazy that you're doing. And there's a little more bad news before things get better. Are you ready for this? Okay. So the other part of it that makes it even worse goes back to something about our about the world of uh, what it's called referred to as a small world. How many of you have heard the phrase "what a small world"? You've all heard the phrase, right? Some from Disney, 
some in other contexts, etc. But in um, but the idea of a small world goes back to this guy by the name of Stanley Milgram. And Stanley Milgram had a nice hobby. He was very interested in trying to uh, travel by himself, meet up with strangers. And when he would meet a stranger, he would try to chat up the stranger. And the goal, his goal was to see how long it would be before he could reach a point in the conversation with the stranger where they will say something like, oh, you know so-and-so, this person was a friend of mine, this person went to the same school, this person went to this, and then you go, oh my God, what a small world, right? So what he did was he decided he's gonna do a little bit of a study. And so he managed to get his friend, uh, Jeffrey Travers, to play along with him. Jeffrey Travers was a stock trader in Boston. And so Stanley, who was at the time, uh, had, had been at Harvard, was no longer actually at Harvard when he did the study, um, he went and told his friends, Jeff Travers, he goes, hey Jeff, I want to send some a random packet to a bunch of random people in Omaha, Nebraska. Why Omaha, Nebraska? Because he thought that culturally Omaha, Nebraska was as far as you could get from Boston. You might want to debate that. But he sent it off to Omaha and he asked the people in Omaha to mail it to somebody they knew on a first name basis who might be able to get it back to Jeff Travers in Boston. Okay, so directly or indirectly. So you give it to somebody you know who gives it to somebody they know, and then ultimately it gets back to Jeff Travers. Now, what do you think happened in a situation like this? Did, did those messages get back to Jeff Travers? Well, they did. About half of them got back to Jeff Travers. Amazing to think about. This was done you know, in the 60s. This experiment was done in the 60s. What was also amazing is that on average, those messages that got back to Jeff Travers got back to him with six steps. Hence the notion of the six degrees of separation that some of you may have heard that phrase, the six degrees of separation. It's been a book, it's a play and so on and so forth. That's where we got that six degrees of separation because on average it took six hops to get from a random person in Omaha, Nebraska to the stock trader. And all they knew about him was his name was Jeff he was a stock trader and he was in Boston. That's all they knew about him, right? Now, here's the remarkable part about this that I think also you must take into account. And that is about more than half, 60% of the messages that got back to, to Jeff Travers got to him through exactly four people in his network. So four of Jeff's friends accounted for more than half of these random messages funneling back to Jeff Travers. Isn't that remarkable? four people in his network. And the question is, what, who were these four people in the network? Well, here is my next question. 60% of the transmissions passed through the same four people. What were the professions of these four people? I'll make it easy for you and say they were actually two people of the same profession. So there were only three professions here. Were these people politicians, clergymen, doctor, attorney, banker, traveling salesman, or educator? Anyone, anyone take, want to take a guess? We were, we were planning to have polling today, but for some technical reasons, we couldn't do it. So hence, all of these questions are now just expecting you to actually speak up. So I would say it would be the clergyman, the uh, banker, the educator, and the doctor. Okay, so you named, you named all four people. So it is appropriate that uh, Marita, whose last name is Paul, answered the polling question, <laughs> right? Okay, well, anyone else want to take a guess? Can someone say one that was definitely not the case or the case, either one? Go ahead, speak up. Doctor is not the case. Doctor is not the case. Why do you think doctor is not the case? Um, just because they tend to be very enclosed in their own networks of, of people I've observed. Ah, you're getting at something interesting. So the correct answer was actually uh, this, this, this uh, formatting is a little off. Krish is right. It was the clergyman, the attorney, and the two traveling salesmen. The clergyman, the attorney, and two traveling salesmen. And you might ask yourself, why? What is it about a clergyman, an attorney, and a traveling salesman that made them the ones who were most, most likely to, they were, that were the people who knew Jeff Travers and reached it to him? Any, any thoughts? What is it about them? They seem to have a larger um, network or touch point with people because that's, they, that's 
that's what they see every single day. They just have a lot more people in their lives. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. That's a very good point. And that is absolutely true. They do have a large number of people in their life. But that's not the only reason. That is a big part of it, but it's not the only reason. What else could it be? Referrals. Beg your pardon? Referrals. Referrals. Aha. Uh -huh. So uh, you think that clergymen get a lot of referrals? Uh, possibly. Yeah, that could be it. Well, um, for, every, uh, for every person that the clergyman knows, he probably knows uh, extended members of their families as well. There you go. So you see that there are extended members of families. So this is all elaborating the size of the network. And you're all right about it. And you're all explaining why referrals, extended families would each do something about it. Uh, Marita is adding it's intentional about connecting with people. Yes, they have an opportunity and a need to connect with people. That's a very good point. Yes. What about others? I think at their cores, these professions do require a level of outreach that I think is is not met necessarily by the others. You know, I do agree that the doctor, you know, you might have some outreach with the doctor or definitely a politician, but they kind of have their own circle. Um, yes. You know, if you're going to be a good attorney, if you're going to be a good traveling salesman, I mean, my goodness, you're going to everybody. You're going to everybody. So everybody means you're going to diverse people. And it's not just the size of the um, network, but it's the diversity of the network. It's how many different types of people that you meet that you do that. And Chris, you know, doctor is an interesting one because a doctor, if you think of the doctor's social network, they hang out amongst doctors. They could potentially have it. And so I want to introduce you to a concept that I've been playing around with for the last year that I want to share with you and to get your sense on it. And that concept is the concept of the extent to which our networks are made up of discretionary versus non-discretionary networks. And I want you to think about this vis-a-vis -vis your own profession. So some people, we are normatively expected to be part of our network, right? And I call that the non-discretionary part of our network. And I will make the case that the traveling salesmen, the clergymen, are people who, by the nature of their profession, are required to have very diverse non-discretionary networks. It just happens to be that way. Some professions don't have that. And I want you to think about your professions and where you have been and where you have worked. Did, did your job require you to? Just as Kat was telling us, well, they have to do this, right? That's the non-discretionary part of it. It is part of their job. But for others, it's not necessarily part of their job. And that's an important concept to recognize because as we've learned from decades of research, successful people have diverse networks. But also as you are seeing now, some professions automatically give diversity to your network while others may not do that. I can tell you as an academic, we don't necessarily need to have very diverse networks. It's like doctors. That's why they call us the ivory tower. If we choose, we can just hang out and talk amongst other academics and live in our ivory tower. And then that's the end of it, right? That's why we get insulated from many people. Now, I hope I'm not the case. I hope that some of us reach out and talk to different kinds of people, but it could be that you could be just in your own circle of working, et cetera. So here is, uh, here is something you may have seen, Harper Lee said, you can choose your friends, but you, can't, you sure can't choose your family and they're still kin to you no matter whether you acknowledge them or not and makes you look right silly when you don't, right? You can't choose your family, that's true. But you can not answer their calls, invite them to any special occasions and forget that they even exist. But when it comes to your professional network as opposed to your family, you can't choose your, you, you, can, you, you have to uh, network with them and you have to answer their calls and you have to invite them to special occasions and not forget that they even exist. That's just, that's a given for you. And so because of this, some, some occupations require, by their very nature, require you to have diverse networks, but others don't. And so one of the questions I wanna leave you with as you think through and join this program is to what extent are you having a diverse network and to what extent is that by virtue of the profession that you're in, as opposed to not being in a particular profession? And I want you to think about going back to the ick factor. I want you to think about the fact that you have this potential network. So the blue circle that you see is all the people that you may have connected with on LinkedIn to go back to the earlier conversation of the joke, or the people that you connect with, et cetera. So you can make a list of everyone you know. That's your potential network. However, 
At any given moment, we know that the people you think about, who you cognitively activate, is only a subset of that. And here is what the research has shown us. Because of our cognitive capacity, because of our neuro capacity, the people we remember varies across people and across time. Some of us are better at remembering who in our network we should be reaching out to. Others, not so much. The same person is better at some times than at other times. In particular, the research shows that when you're stressed out, when you're not doing well, that's when you have the least likelihood of activating your broader network. Guess what? That's when you probably need your broader network the most. So if you think about it, we know from research that we get jobs we find out about new job opportunities, like in the stress that we're living in right now. We know we, we need to be looking for those job opportunities when we are stressed out. And we often get our jobs, not from our strong connections, but from our acquaintances, from our weak ties. They are the ones who bring more novel information to us. So we find out about jobs from our weak ties. And ironically, in times of stress, such as when you're looking for a job, those are the exact ties that you don't cognitively activate. So you're less likely to activate your ties, exactly the weak ties, exactly at the time when you most need those weak ties. So one of the things that we're gonna be talking about in this class is being much more conscious about these issues. What are the strategies we need to use to make sure that we can cognitively activate our network? Because there's no point in having a network if we don't activate it. And we, we don't activate it because in stress time, we don't do that. The other part of it is that, so you can think of the potential network as a latent network. Your Facebook friends is like your latent network. One of our colleagues referred to as a dormant network. It's sleeping. It's there, but it's sleeping. It's that high school friend that you still maintain contact with. And Facebook is really a great opportunity and LinkedIn is a great opportunity to maintain your dormant networks and your latent networks. People say, oh, I have so many friends on Facebook and like, but you can't, no one can have so many friends. Well, yes, but Facebook is really not your social network. It's your dormant network. It's your late network. It's waiting to be activated. And your cognitively activated network is the, is the network that you think about. Who do I need to call about this particular issue? And today's world, we have to rely on activating this network. And we are not all very good at cognitively activating that network. The next part, of course, is mobilizing the network. That is, even if I know I can reach so-and-so, because of the it factor we talked about earlier, you may not feel courageous enough or comfortable enough or moral enough to actually mobilize the network. It's one thing to say, I need to go to Toby. The Toby would probably have the answer to this question. It's another thing to say, not only am I going to go to Toby, and not only do I think about Toby, but I actually reach out to him. That's the mobilized network, the people that I actually reach out to. And then finally, the realized network is the network where someone like Toby helps me realize my goals. So that's the realized network, the people who actually deliver on my network. So all of this to say that what we are trying to do out here is to understand how we can get better at taking our potential network, being aware of how to cognitively activate it, what are the strategies that we actually use to then mobilize the network, and then to realize the network. I'm going to close in the last three minutes. The, sl the slide deck that I might have shown you if I had given you a talk before Leslie is the slide deck that she showed you because that was a presentation that we've been doing with space research. But I'm steering clear of anything that she talked about, et cetera. And instead, I'm going to show you some other work that we've been doing in the coronavirus. This is not in space. This is actually data that we collected in the coronavirus period. And we collected this data from uh, data that we got uh, from, let me just jump ahead. Let me show you some networks. We were looking at the extent to which people's networks are changing right now as a result of this. So the data that we used out here was data that we had collected in China, and it was from a multinational company out there. And we collected a survey that we happened to have done just by chance, but who talks to whom before COVID hit in December, just by entire coincidence. And then we went back and collected Zoom data or the equivalent of Zoom data from them during that. So it was a sample size of about 191 people. We got their demographic data, but then the window as you see for the survey was in, in late December. 
And then the, this was the final sample and the teams that they belong to, et cetera. And what we looked at here was to see the extent to which they were making calls during and before COVID, et cetera. So this was their, what we call the mobilized network. And the mobilized network here refers to one-on-one -on -one calls. So it's making, not being on a conference call like this, but actually making a direct call to somebody. And you see that over the period of time, there were some real changes in the way that network developed, et cetera. I'm just gonna jump ahead and say, here are some results to see. How before um, employees mobilized significantly larger networks during COVID-19 than before COVID-19. So we have the digital data before, we have it during, and you see there are some big differences here. Formal leaders did not mobilize larger networks more, did not mobilize them more than non-leaders did during the period of the COVID crisis. And informal leaders mobilized much larger networks. Informal leaders basically means people who in the survey were told to us by other people that I look to this person for leadership, irrespective of whether they were actually technically leaders, et cetera. So anyway, all of this too, this, this is a lot of numbers, I didn't want to put it, but what we also have noticed that formal leaders and cohesive teams had smaller mobilized networks during this. And so the leaders got together and talked amongst themselves a lot as soon as the COVID crisis broke and, didn't, and then disbanded uh, again after they all came back together. I know I'm at the top of the hour, so I'm going to stop here. I'm happy to take any questions that any of you may have, but also just give you a sense that the most important thing that you can do to get out of the ick factor is don't approach any network tie with the question, what can this person do for me but instead focus on what can I do for that person. If you approach any network tie, any acquaintance with, I wanna learn more about what Seth is doing, what makes Seth tick, and then see how I can help him. That's the surefire single most important way in which you can help remove the ick factor and stop having to shower and use soap after you uh, take silly tests like the ones I gave you at the start of class today. Thank you. Um, this is terrific, Nishir. Thank you so much. Do you have a couple minutes for questions? Or do I do. I, yes, I'm okay. free. If anybody has any questions, feel free to either unmute yourself or, or type them into the chat and we can take a couple minutes. I also know that we told everybody that this was going to be 30 minutes, so if you need to leave, please feel free. Yes, um, and I will see you back in a few months. Yeah. Any questions? I know for me, I think there's a very big difference in the, the, the nature of the ick factor in reaching out to strong ties versus weak ties, right? I'm much more comfortable reaching out to strong ties to ask for help and even offer assistance than um, with weak ties. And I don't know if that comes out in research or if you have any advice. Yes, that does come out in research because the strong ties are very helpful when it comes to social support but the strong ties are not the ones that it turns out and uh, in terms of getting you new information, like information about jobs, about opportunities, et cetera. And the reason is that when you talk to your strong ties, many of your strong ties may know each other. So they circulate the same information within that group. It's your weak ties who have strong ties to other people that could bring you novel information, et cetera. So Toby, you're absolutely right. It really does help with social support, but it doesn't help you for new opportunities as much because of the fact that you're not getting weak ties there, et cetera. Yep, good point. I see several of you leaving very nice comments here. So thank you for uh, th thank you for your compliments and thank you for sticking around. Does anyone else have any other closing question? Okay, thank you, Andrea. I see some of you have learned how to use all these nice Zoom icons and all that. <laughs> That's great. So everybody's clearly coming to a communication program to become more comfortable communicating with strangers. And so that's something that will, I'm sure, evolve for everybody <laughs> as we move through. Um, but it's been terrific. And I think it's just such a great introduction to these, these concepts in your class. And, and Colette said it best, and this is the purpose, is that she's excited for your class now. Um, but it's fun for us to watch, like right now, you're all weak ties with each other in 12 months the expectation is that you will all be very strong ties um, with each other and through through going through the program and not only just by the nature of interacting with each other but understanding the concepts that uh, that uh, Nashir, Michelle and Leslie all talk about regularly and being able to be intentional about your connections with each other. So um, we're looking forward to, to getting started in a month or so. 
I'm looking forward to seeing you all in class. Uh, who knows, maybe in person. We'll wait and see. It'll be in the spring. Uh, so in the meantime, good luck with everything and welcome to the MSC program. We're all excited to have your cohort in there.